this is going to be fun tonight. I'm excited that you all came. Um, this is a topic that is very interesting to me, but I haven't actually gotten to present on it yet, so I'm kind of excited. You guys are my guinea pig audience to see if you like this info, so please leave me some feedback if you like it or not. Um, so I have a, this is kind of a really big topic, and so I unfortunately probably could stand here and talk to you all night about nutrition, but I'm trying to cut it down to an hour, so I'm just giving you a little bit of an overview of nutrition, and definitely if you have questions more specifically, you can ask those at the end. And also I've tried to give you some good information in your handouts and websites to help you if you need more information um, down the road or if you want to look things up when you get home. Okay. Um, so it's a complicated topic, and one thing in pediatrics that we say in general is that kids are not little adults. And so you cannot treat nutrition in kids the same way you can approach it in adults. Um, everything changes as kids grow, what you give them, how much, how often is different through those different stages of childhood. And I think sometimes what I see with parents now is that it's almost like they have information overload because they're getting advice from grandma, they're getting advice from daycare, they're finding out what their friends are doing, they're looking stuff up online. Um, so it's almost like a little bit of overwhelming knowledge that we have in what's right, what's wrong, and what should we do. So hopefully we'll give you a little bit of answers to that. Okay, so my goals for tonight are to give you just an overview of nutrition requirements for the different ages, and then another big part of this, which I think for all pediatricians is something that we're really getting passionate about, childhood obesity, and how can we make sure that our kids are not going to have that problem, or if they do, how can we address it, and to give you some good resources for info on how to be healthier, eat healthier, um, plan ahead, have good meals. So nutrition age zero to six months. Um, we recommend breastfeeding if possible. Um, and that's what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends. We know that breast milk is best um, uh, for babies. And so that's always what we advocate for and try to help moms the best that we can to, to be successful at breastfeeding. If for whatever reason it doesn't work out, then we'd recommend a cow's milk based formula um, for that baby instead. And there are some other more specialized formulas that I won't get into, but some babies have a need for a more specialized formula than the regular cow's milk. But in general, formulas and breast milk are about 20 calories per ounce. And parents always want to know, well, how much should the baby be eating in a 24-hour period? And the rule of thumb, if you're looking at volume, is about five to six ounces per kilogram of body weight in a 24-hour period for good growth, and that's in that infant period. Um, a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, so that's a conversion factor that we use a lot, but when we um, babies come to us, we actually have their weight in the chart in kilograms as well as pounds because we dose everything and base a lot of our calculations in pediatrics on kilograms, so that's a good rule of thumb. Um, breastfed babies, it's harder to tell because if you're nursing all the time, you don't exactly know how much they're getting, and when they're a newborn, they might eat um, 8 to 12 times in a 24-hour period, and then as they get older, they'll eat more efficiently and maybe less often. So with breastfed babies, we're really watching their weight gain as a sign of whether they're getting enough to eat. But the frequency may decrease over time as they get older, but probably a, the amount is still, volume-wise, is going to go up as they get a little bit older, but they might not have to nurse as often as they did when they were newborns. Another big part about um, infant, newborns and infants is vitamin D supplementation. So we know that um, breast milk doesn't probably have quite enough vitamin D, and probably a lot of us aren't getting enough vitamin D, which is maybe something I'll touch on later. So all of us probably need a little extra vitamin D, and we know that our breastfed babies do, and there's lots of over-the-counter drops that we can use to give them that extra vitamin D. And moms always say, well, if I'm taking vitamins, then why do I have to give the baby a vitamin? But this is a specific instance where even though you take your vitamin, you still need to give the baby some extra vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D does a lot of things. It helps with bone development. It also helps our immune system. And there's a lot of research into what else vitamin D is help, helpful with. And so it is important to make sure your babies get that. And we want them to get about 400 international units of vitamin D each day. And if you're a formula-fed baby, that's generally been added to the formula. So you shouldn't have to give them extra if they're strictly on formula. And the other big question I get is, well, what if they do some breast milk and some formula? And I, I always say, if most of your feeds are breast milk, then do the vitamin D. If most of your feeds are formula, it's probably not as big of a deal. But you're not really going to hurt them by giving them a little bit of extra. 
So I think when parents come to me, especially with their first baby, they're very, have lots of questions and worries about starting food and when do I start food and what do I do and how do I do it? Um, so around age four to six months, we can do a little bit of solid food. Usually what we recommend to start is a cereal, um, rice cereal, oat or barley. Those are all good ones that um, should be kind of lower allergy causing and gentle and easy to digest. I don't really recommend any solid foods before age four months, which I think is different from 30 years ago. So a lot of parents will come in and say, well, grandma said I should be giving them this now. And we've, you know, we've learned and grown over time. So we know that the babies really don't need anything before four months. Um, usually I don't have you add cereal to the bottle and except in specific instances. Um, usually I want you to try to give it on a spoon and you're going to mix it with a little bit of breast milk or formula or water. And usually just kind of once a day to start. Um, so it kind of talks there about how much is adequate and you're going to make it pretty watery at first so the baby can get used to taking something off a spoon and then as they get a little better at it, you're going to thicken it up. Um, one of the important things that cereals do give is some iron and we know that babies who are breastfed tend to need a little bit of extra iron when they hit about six months. It kind of diminishes in the breast milk so giving them a little bit of iron fortified cereal is a good way to get that iron in them. But I really just don't want people to stress out about it. If their baby doesn't like it, put it away and try it again in a couple weeks. It's not the end of the world if they don't get a lot of cereal. And a lot of parents want to know, well, then do I not feed them as much, nurse them as much, or give them as many bottles? Um, but really calorie-wise, the bang for your buck is still your um, breast milk or formula. So don't take away from those feeds just to give a bunch of cereal. I still want you to do your normal feeding schedule. And this is a little bit of a supplement to your nursing or bottles. And so then usually the six month checkup is when I start to talk to parents about um, adding other solid foods, um, fruits, veggies, meats, and parents have lots of questions. My first time parents always get out a piece of paper and a pen and they write down everything I say word for word because they're afraid they're gonna mess it up. How much, what am I supposed to do? When am I supposed to do it? How much am I supposed to give them? And they're writing furiously and I just have to tell them, it's okay, you're not, it's, you're not gonna mess it up. <laughs> it's gonna be okay no matter how you do it. Um, so let me see here. So you can't mess it up. Um, my general guidelines are you're going to start with one new food at a time. And the reason that we have you do that is if we would ever see a reaction, some kind of allergic reaction, it's nice to know that the only new thing the baby's had is that particular food. If you give them peas and carrots and squash and, you know, turkey all in the same 24-hour period and they have hives, maybe the hives weren't from any of them, but it's a little bit harder to sort it out, I think. So it's nice to do one new food at a time. And you wait about four or five days and then add another new one. And I don't really have a preference which order you go in. I think a lot of um, physicians will tell you that we'd prefer you start the less sweet foods first because we don't want the babies to think that everything needs to taste really, really sweet. So the veggies or even a little bit of the meats versus doing all the fruits first. If you do all the fruits first, I think you'll have a baby who doesn't enjoy their vegetables as much. They'll expect everything to be sweet. So I usually tell people to do veggies or meats before the fruits. And then you'll just watch for rashes, hives, swelling of the face, um, you know, severe tummy upset, which severe vomiting or diarrhea after a new food that you've seen occur maybe more than once when you're giving that same food to them would be maybe a cause for concern that you'd want to talk to the doctor about. And so in this time frame, kind of that six to eight month time frame, you're still gonna be giving a fair amount of breast milk or formula between 24 and 36 ounces or about five to eight breastfeeds in a day. Still probably once or twice a day some cereal, um, once or twice a day some veggies or fruits or a little bit of both, and that's probably gonna increase over time. You'll probably start with about half a jar, but it'll probably go up as they start to have their likes and dislikes and get used to feeding off a spoon. And actually, a lot of people, for some reason, seem to be a little bit leery of doing meats, but especially with those breastfed infants, we know that meat is a really another good source of iron and zinc, which sometimes, again, we're not getting quite enough in the breast milk. So I'm definitely an advocate for if you're not having a preference to be vegetarian or something, go ahead and start those meats on the earlier side versus the later side. And we don't really recommend juice routinely. If you want to give them little drinks of something with their meal, we'd prefer that you just stick with water. Um, if you are going to give a little bit, no more than four ounces a day, or you could do half and half, like two ounces of juice with two ounces of water, something like that. So don't really need juice routinely. 
And then as you go get closer to that one year of age, nine to 12 months, they're gonna start doing um, more solids. They're gonna do chunkier foods. They're gonna do more little finger foods, um, start trying to feed themselves, pick up little chunks and feed themselves. And you're gonna start offering more of what you're eating, soft foods that you're having for dinner, let the baby try some. You're having rice, let the baby try some. You're having some cooked veggies, let the baby have some. Pasta, toast, um, avocado is great. That's a great healthy fat for you. So there's lots of things that um, you can certainly give your baby um, from your own meal and kind of work towards that. Cooked ground, fine meats, mashed potatoes, all those type of things. Work on the sippy cup. When they're at the table at the high chair, you can give formula or breast milk or water. And this is not a slam against grandparents, but that's always going to be the person who gives them their first taste of something not as good for them, I think. <laughs> my mom gave my three-month-old cake batter, and I about lost it, but he was fine. So anyway, I'm like, Mom, cake batter has raw eggs. What are you doing? Seriously. <laughs> um, so that's what the grand – that's their job. That's their job. That's grandparents' job, so that's okay. Um and then at a year, that's kind of a big transition. So you're not really a baby anymore. Now you're becoming a toddler. I really like you to get done with the bottle. I'm more of a little bit of a stickler about that. Um, I think the longer you hang on to the bottle after a year, the harder it will be to get rid of it. So I really advocate trying to be done with the bottle. Feed them their drinks um, in a sippy cup or a regular cup or a cup with a straw, whatever you want to do, but try to get rid of that bottle. And um, you can transition from formula to... Um, regular cow's milk that's that vitamin d whole milk so it's higher fat has vitamin d added and that's the red lid at the store um, and breastfeeding if you want to continue that is we're fine with that we don't have a problem with that that's really a choice between the mom and the baby some babies are ready to be done sometimes some moms are ready to be done some babies wean themselves even before a year so that's you know individual and i think whatever works for you is fine we're happy if you keep breastfeeding and if you don't that's fine too um, I do want to say a comment about milk. I think in a lot of people's minds, milk is good. So if the child wants milk and milk and milk, they just keep giving it to them because they think milk, milk is healthy for you. And it is to some extent, but too much milk can actually be a bad thing. So normally you're going to shoot for anywhere from 16 to 24 ounces a day of milk. But I have these little patients that I call milkaholics and they just want milk all the time. So they'll drink eight sippy cups of milk a day, you know, eight, six ounce sippy cups, that's 48 ounces of milk a day. That's too much milk. And the reason that it's too much milk is we don't have good iron in cow's milk. So you're replacing probably a meal with milk and you're not getting your iron. Also, that much milk is really hard on your intestinal tract. It can actually cause a little bit of microscopic bleeding. So not only are you not getting iron in your diet, you're losing it by this microscopic blood loss. And so you can get anemic. Um, you can get constipated. That much milk is hard also on your bowels in terms of not getting stuff to move through. Then they don't eat well. They're never hungry because they're just chugging milk all the time. And sometimes they don't gain weight well. And so when I have a parent who comes in and says, my toddler is never hungry. They just won't eat. And then I always say, well, how much milk do they drink? Because that's always what I'm thinking next. Well, if your child's drinking 40 something ounces of milk a day, no wonder they're not hungry and not eating. And you have to, you have to be a little bit tough and cut them off a little bit because you want them to get the food as well. So just remember that you need to, if they want, they're wanting something to drink, give them water in between. And toddlers are challenging. And I think that's a stressful age for parents on many levels. And food is just one of those battles. Um, it is hard. I have seen firsthand um, battles over food and meals, and it's difficult. You have to pick your battles a little bit sometimes. Um, I think it really helps to try to sit down when you can and eat meals as a family. And I'll talk about that more again later with bigger kids. But with toddlers, I think everybody sitting down and eating together versus the toddler just sort of messing around with their food and then running off and playing and coming back and taking a bite, you're kind of going to lead to this disordered grazing. And that's toddlers graze a little bit, but I think that encourages it if you don't really all sit down together and have a true meal. Um, trying to do regular meals and snacks, three meals a day, maybe a couple snacks in between. Try to keep the snacks healthy. We'll talk about that later. And remember with toddlers that you're probably going to have to introduce those new foods multiple times before they accept them. So if there's a new vegetable you're trying, they're probably not going to take it the first time or the second time or maybe even the fifth time, but you still need to keep offering it. And so one good rule of thumb is to give them one thing that you think they'll always eat, one thing that they might eat and one thing they probably won't eat and try to get them at least to have one bite of everything but you know there's one thing on their plate they'll eat and hopefully that's something healthy 
something that maybe they'll take a couple bites of and something they're probably not going to like, but you're going to keep trying and offering it. So that's a good way to do it. And be realistic about food amounts, and we'll talk about portions. But for toddlers, you know, about a fourth the size of an adult portion is what you're looking at. So they're not always going to be eating a huge volume. Um, but again, they might eat more volume if they're not filling up on the liquids. Or you can do a tablespoon of food per year of age um, for each of those little food groups. Um, and again, limit the juice. And try not to use the desserts and snacks and sweet stuff as a reward. You know, if you eat all your dinner, then you get ice cream. Try to do it um, as not necessarily having dessert or that fruit is part of your meal and that's the sweet part of your meal and not really a quote-unquote dessert. And there's a few things about toddlers um, and kids in general, I think, that are helpful. Um, they've actually studied this, and kids are more accepting of, like, fruits and vegetables if they're cut up into smaller pieces. So if you give a child a whole apple and try to make them bite into the apple and eat it like that, they're not going to do it. If you slice the apple up into little slices, they'll be more likely to eat it. So a lot of those fruits and veggies, I think if you just make them a little bit fun or try to think outside the box of how you can present this in a more fun way or a more kid-friendly way, little kebabs of fruit or things like that, little sticks of veggies, um, they're more likely to eat those. They like little pieces and um, little finger foods like that. Not too hot or not too cold of food, that's a big one for toddlers. Um, make sure your meat is ground up real finely, those choking hazards like thick, you know, stringy, chewy steak or pork chops or roasts that are, you know, thicker and chewier are going to be hard for toddlers to handle, so more finely ground meats. Kids don't want food to touch each other, so don't let it touch. <laughs> so they like foods to be separate. So where we might want all our vegetables mixed in together, put their foods, the vegetables, in separate piles. My uncle used to eat only one food at a time, and he said that his dad would always yell at him and say it all goes to the same place anyway in your stomach, so why do you do that? And he said, well, you taste it in your mouth. <laughs> I mean, you just, you know, you have to, that part, I think, if that's how they want it, then then do it. And the other thing kids like to do is dip stuff. So things that they can dip, um, sticks they can dip. It doesn't always have to be a fry dipped in ketchup. It can be carrots dipped in low-fat ranch or fruit dipped in some low-fat yogurt or um, veggies or crackers dipped in hummus. Kids like to dip, so remember that. Try to have some fun, healthy dips that they can put their food into. And this is kind of what I said before. A variety of new foods, um, even if they don't like them the first time, keep offering. And just make sure that the child's sitting in a secure chair while they're eating and the, not, they're not doing the run by the table and grab a bite and keep on running and playing. Try to get them to sit down and have the meal with you. Just a really quick note on choking. Um, we talk about choking hazards, so hard nuts, hard candies, raw carrots, or sometimes apples can be pretty tough. I think depending on what version of apple you get can be hard and kind of choking. A big glob of peanut butter by itself is thick and sticky. Um, a little bit of peanut butter on a cracker or toast is probably okay. Hot dogs, big choking hazard that we always talk about. So if you're gonna do hot dogs, please Cut them into quarters. Um, sometimes even taking the skin off helps. Um, grapes are another big choking hazard. So anything that can get stuck in a little windpipe, um, make sure you're keeping an eye on your child while they're eating. And we don't want choking to happen. And then I think the next part of my talk that I really wanted to focus on is just um, school age and beyond, because I think it really starts to get more complicated then for many reasons. Um, Kids get pickier, they see commercials on TV for food they want, they're at school with their friends, well, so-and-so got to have a Lunchable in their lunch every day this week, why can't I have a Lunchable? Um, you know, we're at the store, I want Fruit Loops, Mom, and they're bugging you, bugging you, I want, want you to buy me Fruit Loops. And so you're having all this sort of pressure, influence from your kids, influence from outside. And, you know, everybody's very busy now. We're all running around, most families are two parents working, and you're trying to cram everything in, and you're tired. And so how do you make sure that these kids who have to go to school to an activity after that um, are going to get a healthy meal on top of everything else that you have to do? It's really hard. I think that's a struggle that we all have. Um, the drive through is quicker and easier, and then they're happy because you got them something that they thought they wanted. So I think a lot of parents struggle with that. How can we do this, um, keep our kids eating somewhat healthfully most of the time, and live this crazy life that we're living. So we'll talk about that, hopefully give you some good tips. And I think, again, it's that information overload. So 
if you get on the internet and I've been on the internet more for this talk, looking at stuff. And then I talk to patients about these things too. I have patients that are on a vegan diet. I have patients that are on a gluten-free diet. I have patients that are on a low carb diet. I think a lot of toddlers are kind of self selectively on a high carb diet and they don't want to eat protein. And some people are on this paleo caveman paleolithic diet where they don't eat any thing processed in any dairy. And so there's like all these diets that you could try and what are, what's healthy and is it okay if your kid eats paleo or if your child is vegan? And I mean, what are you supposed to do with all that info? There's way too much info on the internet, I think sometimes, and it doesn't always help us do the best thing for our kids. Um, and there's some problems with how we're eating. And there's a lot of problems with how America is eating. And that's part of our obesity em epidemic. And so one problem we have is about portions and how they've changed over the years. And I think if we go to restaurants, we would all agree that the portions are getting out of control. Um, they're much larger in the U.S. than they are in other parts of the world. European portions are quite a bit smaller. I think European clothing sizes are smaller than U.S. clothing sizes. So... Um, we need to work on our portions. Um, one other thing that I forgot to put in the slides is just a little side note about school lunches. I was going to put something in there. Um, you know, school lunches are kind of another um, bone of contention and an area of criticism for our kids and healthy eating and that a lot of our school lunches are probably highly processed foods and not enough fruits and vegetables. And I think our schools are actually doing a better job. I have to give my hats off to Mrs. Obama because I think she's really... Um, been part of the driving force behind mm. that. Um, it makes me happy to see that there's positive changes. My kids just came home today from school. Um, they go to school in Papillion and they just started a fruit and vegetable bar. So they were very excited about um, this fruit and vegetable bar that they got to go and pick whatever fruits and vegetables they wanted off the fruit and vegetable bar instead of just getting the green beans or whatever was on the menu. So that's really awesome. And I think that's a great thing. I hope that continues. Um, as we go forward, I hope we can have more healthy eating and healthy choices at our schools because a lot of our kids are getting a lot of their meals at school. And so to not have chicken nuggets and and then I have a slide on here about just the changes in our portions over the years. So, you know, 20 years ago, a bagel was three inches in diameter, was 140 calories. Now it's six inches in diameter, it's 350 calories. So it's doubled. The size of our bagels have doubled. Um, a regular cheeseburger in the 70s was 330 calories, a Whopper 600 calories. Um, they used to have six and a half ounce sodas. I mean, that's the size of probably a little juice box. Um, French fries, we used to get two and a half ounce French fries for 200 calories, and now we get um, 600 calories in a French fry, in an average French fry. So I think our, you know, our portions and what we expect to be a normal amount for an adult is too much and what we expect a normal amount for a kid is probably also too much when we go out to eat um, and some of what our portion expectations are. And so it's kind of good and this is a little bit of science that I've thrown in there of how much food do kids really need. Um, and so we look at calorie requirements based on age and weight and sex and also activity level. So that's a complicated formula and I'm just giving you some very sort of general guidelines so we do learn about this um, when we're in our pediatric training. And the most of the times when I was calculating calorie requirements was babies. When I was doing the NICU rotation and I had to figure out how much does this little preemie who's 30 weeks and weighs three and a half pounds, how many calories does that baby need a day? And there's a lot of math behind that. So as a general rule of thumb, when you're an infant, you need about 100 calories per kilogram of body weight per day. So um, that's how we get our math, 100 calories per kilogram per day. Ta so babies are doing a lot, a lot, a lot of growing. They usually double their birth weight by six months, triple it by a year. So that's why they need so many calories. It's almost like they're eating Thanksgiving dinner every time they eat. So there's no way we would be able to handle that many calories. We're not growing. Um, they have a ton of energy expenditure with all their growth that they're doing. And so they need that high amount of calories per body weight. Toddlers, it's about 80 to 90. That's probably more than you'd think. When I'll show you the slides of how that math works out, it's probably more than you'd think. Um, elementary age, it starts to really vary then based on activity. If you have a pretty sedentary child, they're going to need that lower end of the range. If you have a real active child, they're going to need the higher end. Teenagers, again, 
Real active teenagers, probably closer to this 50 to 60 calories per kilogram per day. And especially during that puberty growth spurt, um, those teenage boys are going to eat, you know, over 2,000 calories a day when they're growing um, easily, especially if they're in sports or active. And then adults, we don't need very much. 20 calories per kilo per day is probably all we need. Men always need more than women. Not fair for us, I know. Um, and then, you're, you know, if you're very active and you're burning a lot of calories, you're going to need more. Um, so here's a couple examples of just some math that I did for you. So if you have a 30-pound three-year-old and you're looking at that 80, 80 to 90 calories per kilo per day, it'd be around 1,000 or 1,100. So, you know, that's a fair amount. Now, some of that's going to come from their drink. If they're drinking the whole milk, that's going to be higher calorie drink. Um, a 70-pound 10-year-old, which is what I have at home, moderately active boy, he requires about 17 to 1800 calories a day. And I tell you what, we always tell my son he has a hollow leg because I don't know where he puts it all. He just eats and eats and eats. He can eat three plates of spaghetti and meatballs, but he's tall and skinny. Um, and a sedentary woman who's got like an office job, not getting a ton of exercise, you know, to maintain her weight, 1400 calories a day. If she's trying to lose weight, it'd be less than that. So, you know, these kids um, in some ways need more calories than we do sometimes if they're active, but we have to remember that we need them to be good, healthy calories too. So that's a little bit of math for you. Parents ask me that a lot. Well, how many calories does my child need? And there's even a lot more detailed math about your basal metabolic rate and what's your ener energy expenditure and how active are you? And there's little coefficients to multi multiply, but these are just kind of general rules of thumb. If you wanted to sit down and keep a food diary of your child's intake, write it down, try to figure out about how many calories they're eating and then use those guidelines to see if they're falling somewhere in the, that range, that would be a good place to start. And there are dietitians in town that can also help you with that. And these are just, um, just an example of some portion sizes to kind of remind us what's a normal portion size versus some of those crazy big portion sizes that we see at restaurants. Um, you know, a cup of rice or pasta is about the size of a tennis ball. A baked potato is about the size of a mouse on a computer. Um, an ounce of chocolate is about the size of a dental floss packet. Um, three ounces of meat is about the size of a deck of cards. So there's some good kind of visual um, shape, um, you know, pictures for you to remember when you're portioning out food um, that, you know, a, a helping a pasta is not a giant heaping plate full, it's a tennis ball size full. And then I just kind of wanted to pull up something that probably we've all gone to McDonald's and what is that really doing? If we ate a meal at McDonald's, what would that be for our kids? So if we went to McDonald's and the child had a four piece chicken nugget happy meal and they had to have ranch to dip it in because they like to dip right mcdonald's doesn't really have low fat ranch i don't think and the little kid fry that comes in the happy meal now which isn't very big and some apples and some chocolate milk so you think overall it's not horrible right four chicken nuggets fat free chocolate milk the ranch dips probably not helping but some apples still 575 calories and 29 grams of fat if you have a three-year-old toddler that's like half their day in that one meal if they eat all of that stuff um if you had a bigger kid who got the cheeseburger and the small fry and the small orange drink that'd be 640 calories if you got the whole you know just we're gonna blow your day got your big mac combo with your coke and your fries you're looking at like 1100 calories so I feel like even though McDonald's is saying or any fast food restaurant saying, well, we're healthier and you can get fat free milk and you can get fruit. It's I mean, you're still eating fast food and it's still going to add up faster than probably if you made something at home. So it's just good to remember that in the back of your mind, I think. Um, most of the restaurants now have this nutrition info online. I just Googled McDonald's nutrition. And it came right up. So I think it helps sometimes to sit down and look at it, um, especially if you know you're going to be going out to eat a fair amount over a period of time and you're trying to Rain, rain in your calories a, a little bit. It helps to see what are the healthier, lower fat choices at those establishments that you're frequenting. And I think a really big problem is snacks. Um, I think snacks are everywhere. And I think we're sort of a nation of snackers. And there's been some articles recently and stuff in the paper and on TV about how we never really let ourselves get truly hungry because we're always snacking. So we're eating a meal and then we're snacking and we're eating, we're snacking. And so how often are we really truly getting hungry and feeling hungry? Um, school, my kids are allowed to have a snack at school every day. I'm not saying it's bad, but so school, they're getting a snack. I think pretty much every sports game and practice and everything kids are getting a snack I know we have to bring snacks after the games there's always a list you have to sign up you have to bring a treat 
after the soccer game or the baseball game or whatever. At the library, there's a vending machine and a Coke machine and a little thing with the little candy that comes out, the four little things that spin around with the M&Ms and the hot tamales. So that was at the library. At the movies, obviously, at the gas station, in your car, you're eating snacks. At home, you have snacks. So I feel like we're kind of a nation of snackers, and that's not helping our kids because a lot of those places where you're at where there's snacks, there's not always good, healthy snacks. And this one I want to show you later because it's really funny. So we'll try to do this other video at the end um, when snacks get to be such a big deal. So I think when it comes down to it, well, what do we give our kids then? And how do we wade through all this um, info on the Internet? And what about all these snacks? And what about when we go out to eat? And how do we do it? So I think, you know, we have to take the pressure off ourselves a little bit. We have to start somewhere. We have to have a little common sense about it. We need to keep it simple um, and just try to start with, go back to the basics and take a deep breath and see what we need to do. So these are kind of the groups that we're looking at. Um, I put this website on the end of my talk, but this is a really awesome website, choosemyplate.gov, and it is great. It has recipes. It has um, a calorie intake tracker. It has um, tips for eating on a budget. It has um, a lot of stuff for kids. It talks about um, exercise and different energy expenditures. So this is a great, really good source of information and recipes and all of that. So this is kind of a good visual of like, what should your plate look like at meals? Mostly fruits and veggies, some grains, some dairy, some lean protein. So with the grains, and I think a lot of this, I didn't put a huge amount of info on each of these groups because I think you've probably all heard it somewhere. You've read about it. You've heard it on TV. But we know we're supposed to eat the whole grains, which have the entire grain kernel, the whole wheat flour, uh, and the oatmeal, and the brown rice, and the whole grain pasta. And we're going to try to get rid of the white um, the white things. So the white bread and the white pasta and the white flour and all those things that have been refined because that takes out most of the fiber and the B vitamins, and then, um, oh, I put fiber twice. And so then sometimes they enrich them and add them back in, so they'll take everything out, and then they throw some fiber and some B vitamins back in, but that's not nearly as healthy as just eating it in its natural form to begin with. Um, and a lot of the things, this is a personal aside for me, but I kind of dr get driven crazy by all these fiber things that are out there now. There's fiber one bars and fiber one yogurt and fiber cereal and Everything has added fiber, but actually a lot of that fiber that's been added is um, from something called chicory root or inulin is the other name you'll see on the label. And that's um, a f from, so from this plant and they are able to blend this up and it is more of a creamy taste. And that's why the fiber one bar doesn't taste really gritty and fibery. It tastes like a candy bar, basically. Um, and that fiber, if you eat a lot of it, is really hard on your GI tract. It's harder on your GI tract than fiber you'd get if you ate a salad or if you ate some vegetables. And so a lot of people get a lot of bloating and discomfort and gas when they eat a lot of those um, fiber, added fiber products. So I feel like, yes, it's great you're getting some fiber, but how are you getting it? You're not really getting the natural fiber that we intended. You're just, you're getting fiber that they added in the factory and they're sort of blending it up to try to get you to eat your fiber. I'd rather you just eat the vegetable or the fruit. And same with kids. So you know, when kids come in and they're constipated and we talk to parents about eating more fiber and then the parents say, oh, I got these fiber one bars. I'm like, okay, well now the kid's just going to be gassy and uncomfortable all the time and that's not going to help. So we have to go back to square one. So let's keep it simple. Um, proteins, um, lean meat, you know, the lean ground beef, the lean pork, um, chicken breasts, lean turkey, ground turkey, turkey breasts, um, nuts, soy, seafood, which I think me being a native Nebraskan wasn't ever good at until now as I've become more of an adult and trying to be better about how I eat. I didn't know how to make seafood. I didn't like seafood. Um, so I think that's an area that a lot of us Midwesterners struggle with is other than a fish fry, how do we get some good seafood in us? And that's something that we probably all need to work on. And then the other thing about living in Nebraska is probably the idea of not eating meat sometimes seems very unreasonable, but probably all of us need to do a little bit more of a meatless meal once in a while, a meal with beans for your protein instead of hamburger all the time or chicken. Um, so try to remember that you want those lean, lean cuts of meat um, and that it's okay to go meatless once in a while and to try to incorporate a little bit more healthy seafood in your diet. Fruits, um, really, I 
I'm going to stress here that I'm not an advocate for juice. Um, we want you to eat the fruit for the same reason that I just talked about with the fiber. You're getting more benefit if you eat the whole fruit than if you just drink the juice. There was a quote I read that said, fruit is nature's way of getting you to eat your fiber. So they put juice in it, the, in the apples and the oranges and all that to make it taste better and more palatable. And when you just squeeze the juice out and throw the rest away, you're throwing away the best part of the fruit. And so I want you to eat your fruit and not just drink it. And kids, juice is really kind of, I think, has a little bit of a stigma with pediatricians because it's cavity causer. It's a lot of sugar. Even if you buy 100% juice, it's still a lot of sugar sitting on those little teeth. Um, kids like to walk around. If they're not a milkaholic, they might be a juiceaholic. So they're walking around, chugging their juice all day long. Their teeth are never really getting a break from that sugar sitting on there. And then they have, you know, the front four teeth are um, full of cavities and have to be pulled when they're three or four. Um, so if you're going to do juice, try to limit it to just one little serving a day. Um, the only time I really have people do juice routinely is for constipation. Um, but you can do frozen fruit, you can do some dried fruit, fresh fruit, canned fruit. Make sure if it's canned that you're not getting it in the heavy syrup because that has a lot of added sugar. So you want to do this fruit that's canned in its own juice or um, that doesn't have that sugar added to it. Um, frozen fruit's actually really good, pretty reasonably priced. And then remember, fruit that's in season is always going to be cheaper and taste better. So I think you kind of have to adjust your fruit and veggie eating to the season that you're in. This is a good season we're coming up on now. The berries are going to be cheaper. They're going to be fresher. You're going to get the watermelons this summer. Um, so I think that's great. And we have, I think, more of a variety of fruit now accessible to us than, you know, we probably ever have. Just going to any local grocery store, you can get berries and apples and oranges and bananas and kiwis and mangoes and whatever you want. So you have lots of choices and lots of things to offer your kids and try. Veggies, um, again, we're going to recommend you do more of the actual vegetables than the juice. Um, we don't advocate a lot of vegetable juice either. Um, but again, you can do fresh, raw, cooked veggies, uh, frozen veggies. Canned, you have to watch a little bit. Sometimes they have a lot of added salt, so I'd probably stick more with the frozen than the canned. But um, frozen does preserve all the nutrients. Um, and there's lots of different ways to, you know, cook vegetables and mix them into your foods. And there's so many different kinds. I think that's an area that I still need to work on. And there's some vegetables that I think we're all, at least I am sort of afraid I buy it and then I don't really know what to do with it. And so I think um, probably all of us parents need to go look up some recipes. I've been buying kale. I made it a couple times. No one would eat it except for me at my house. My husband wouldn't eat it. So I'm sort of afraid of it, but I know it's good for you, and I just have to figure out how to cook it the way my family will like it <laughs> and still have it be mostly healthy, but at least I'm buying it, right? So I'm trying something different. Um, but, you know, I think you can also sort of have your go-to vegetables that you know everyone will eat, that you know how to cook, that are easy. There's all those steam-in-the-bag ones now that you just stick them in the microwave, and five minutes later you have peas from the freezer or green beans or whatever. So that's good. And there's five subgroups of veggies. There's the starchy ones. Um, there's the starchy, there's the red and yellow, there's the dark leafy green like your spinach and romaines. Um, there's the kind of peas and beans group and then there's other. Um, so that's actually on my plate, choosemyplate.gov. There's the whole breakdown of the five subgroups. And there's some other tips. Um, to make, you know, make veggies better, the fresh in-season veggies, microwaving the veggies. Um, I think that some of us, at least, I think I used to think this way at the store. I'd think, well, I shouldn't spend all this money on the pre-packaged salad because it's so expensive. But then I'm thinking, well, I can buy this big container of lettuce that's romaine and healthy for five bucks, and I can make salads with that for a whole week. So really, that's not that much money. So why in my head do I think that's a lot of money when I would spend you know, $5 on um, a thing of chips or, you know, a couple bags of chips. Why wouldn't I spend $5 on a big container of salad that would last all week? So I think we have to shift our thinking a little bit. And in, living in Nebraska, we're lucky because in the summer, you can have a garden or you can go to a farmer's market or one of those roadside stands and get really, really yummy, fresh produce really cheaply. Um, we have a corn guy in Papillion and Everybody that lives in Papillion, I think, knows the corn guy, and that is, like, the best corn you've ever eaten. And so my kids every summer are like, Mom, when are we going to go to the corn guy? Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad that our, that our kids are excited to 
you know, get those really good tasting fruits and veggies from, from the farmers and, and that's good. And that helps our farmers. So it's good. And then the dairy, we kind of talked about the milk intake already, but you know, you want to do beyond that toddler age, beyond about age two or three, we kind of switch to the low fat dairy. So I usually tell patients to stay on whole milk until they're two and then switch to skim is fine with me unless they're really, really thin. And we're trying to get a little bit more calories in them. I'll let, a, I'll let them stay on the higher fat milk. You can do soy milk as well, um, cheese, yogurt, those type of things for your dairy. And then oils, we'll just talk about briefly. Those aren't really a food group, but they give us some essential um, fatty acids that we need. And so we include that in our, in our healthy diet. And so we like the ones that come from fish and plants. Those are healthier for our heart. Um, you know, our canola oil, our olive oil, soybean oil, those kind of things, walnut oil. And then some of these foods that are naturally high in oils like salmon, um, and you have your nuts and your avocados. So those kind of things are, are very healthy for you. And we want to stay away from those shortening and butter from the animal fats, um, those partially hydrogenated fats. Those aren't good for us. Those are some of the trans fats and things like that, lard, sticks of butter, sticks of margarine. We want to use those sparingly. Um, I think once you start cooking with like olive oil, it's really good. And I think you kind of get an acquired taste for that. And it tastes better, I think, than stuff cooked in butter. And then empty calories, which I'm sure we all know what those are, sodas and cakes and cookies and pastries and chips and ice cream and hot dogs, all those processed foods. Um, we want to try to stay away from those things. And so I think a lot of the pitfalls that we have as parents is we go to the supermarket and there's all these foods on the shelves that were made in a factory that are supposed to grab our attention as being healthy. This is healthy. This has added fiber. This is whole grains and whatever. This is at all 100% fruit, you know. And all these things are geared toward us parents who are busy and like, what am I going to throw in the kid's backpack for their snack at school? Oh, these fruit snacks or these fiber one bars or whatever it is. And they're really not healthy for you. And they market to us that they are because they want our money. And so it's you have to kind of shift that mindset. And what am I putting in my cart? And how many ingredients are in this product? Um, you know, cereal, most of the cereal has a lot of sugar. And they'll, they'll say, like, it has all these added vitamins, but it's also has a lot of sugar. And it's not, what is it from? I mean, it's not oatmeal. It's this kind of cereal mass produced in a factory. So that's, that's not good. Um, like pop tarts, not good. Um, yogurt, some yogurt is, has a lot of added sugar as well. I mean, there's yogurts that have 25 or 30 grams of sugar per container, which is several teaspoons of sugar. Um, so I think you have to be careful on when you go to the store and you're looking for snacks or you're looking for things to supplement your meal to, I think a lot of our obesity problem is just too much processed, crappy food. Um, like Lunchables, my kids always want a Lunchable. I don't like Lunchables, they're not healthy for you. I tell them that all the time, they always want them. I had a patient come in once, he was about seven or eight and he was, wasn't was obese at all. And mom said he's been having all these tummy aches. And I did, did an exam on him and I could tell that he was pretty constipated. And so I said, well, what? let's talk about your bowel habits. How often are you pooping? And he was old enough to where I don't think mom realized that he wasn't going to the bathroom regularly. And I said, well, what are you eating? Well, he's a really picky eater. Okay, what does he eat for lunch? Well, he takes a Lunchable every single day. And I said, well, that's why he's not pooping. I mean, there's no fiber. There's nothing good for you in a Lunchable. It's just processed cheese and meat and sugar and fat. And that's not gonna help your digestion. That's not gonna help. So you have to stop that. And she was sort of dumbfounded, like, how, what, you know, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. Why is that wrong? It's for kids. It's supposed to be healthy. It's for their lunch. I can grab it. I can throw it in his lunchbox. It's easy. So these things are marketed towards us for convenience. They're marketed towards our kids. They have little treats in them. And you just kind of have to flip your mindset and say, I know that stuff isn't healthy. And maybe I'm going to have a little bit of it in my house, but maybe I'm going to try to have less of it in my house than I used to. And maybe I'm going to try to switch a little bit of what our snacks are, what our lunches are to being healthier. Um, so that's, those are a list of some things. And there's just a picture. So fruit snacks, Fruit Loops, Pop-Tarts. And dentists will tell you that fruit snacks are one of the absolute worst things that you can give your kids in terms of teeth. So if you're buying fruit snacks, you will eventually be buying your dentist a new car because your child will end up with crowns and root canals. I just had 
a patient today whose dad is a dentist, and I was telling him that I was going to come and talk tonight. And I said, I put a big thing in there about fruit snacks, because that's one takeaway. If you learn nothing else from this talk, please stop buying fruit snacks. I don't buy them. Um, and he said, really, it's exposure time of the sugar on your teeth. Juice is another big culprit that he said, kids that are walking around all day with the sippy cup of juice and that sugar always sitting on their teeth. But the problem with fruit snacks is they're so sticky that they stick in there in those little grooves and you can't get them out. And so that causes cavities. So even if you're brushing, they're getting in between those little teeth and you can't get that out and then they're causing decay. So that's, that's bad. And Fruit Loops, I think, are only good for stringing into necklaces. Um, healthy eating tips are, um, you know, I think healthy eating is hard. It's hard for all of us. If it was easy, then we would all, we wouldn't be having this talk and we wouldn't, you know, be having childhood obesity and it would be no big deal, but it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because you have to think about it and you have to take time to prepare and you have to change habits and you have to plan meals and you have to pack lunches. It's just all these other things that you have to do. But I do think that it gets easier the more you try to do it, the easier it gets. And it's just time and practice. Um, I think that, you know, I don't want parents to put this burden on themselves. Like they need to go home and throw everything in their closet away that has high fructose corn syrup or added fiber that isn't good for you. Um, but think about one or two things you can try to change now and think about, okay, next year, what could I be doing differently? Or look back on what you were doing five years ago. Am I doing something better now than I was five years ago? I think in my house, we're definitely doing some things a lot better than we were five years ago, but we have things that we still need to work on. Um, and I think that nighttime, like getting off work, getting kids from daycare, running kids to sports is a really bad time for all of us. We're all hungry, we're all tired, we're stressed, we just want some dinner. And we all, you know, have that temptation to go run and get some food. And we all give into it sometimes. I do too. But I think as I'm getting older, my kids are getting a little older, I'm realizing like, yes, that might make us feel better for 20 minutes. But then we still have all the other stress that we had before. And also now we have this yucky meal that we just ate that really didn't make us feel very good. And so I'm trying to have in my mind some really easy go-to things that I can come home and have on the table in 10 minutes and feed those ravenous kids and still feel like I gave them a somewhat healthy meal. So I always have to have a really big bowl of fruit in my house now. We always have that. So I can always slice up an apple with dinner, always. I mean, I always have apples. Um, I usually have salad. I can always throw salad in a bowl. Yes, I spent $5 on the prepackaged salad, but it's still salad, <laughs> you know? It's still salad and I can give them salad and I can give them low fat dressing and they'll eat that. Um, I can get things out of the freezer that I can stick in the microwave in five minutes. I can heat up soup. Um, I can make breakfast for dinner, which my kids love, and I think a lot of kids love breakfast for dinner, and eggs are healthy for you. So you can do scrambled eggs, and you can do some whole grain waffles or toast or whatever you want to do, and you can give them fruit with that and some yogurt, and they think it's great because they think breakfast for dinner is great. So that's quick and easy, and it, I don't think it really takes too much longer than sitting in the drive through um, I think the other thing with kids is that they just want to be part of it. So I think the more you talk to them about it and say, well, this is what we're going to have for dinner and we're going to have this fruit and this is really healthy for you and it'll help you be stronger and it'll help you run faster in, in PE or soccer. Um, or why don't you help me? I need your help with supper. Can you come and help me? Can you set the table? Can you help count out the apple slices for everybody? Can you get the salad out of the fridge? Can you get the dressing out? Can you, you know, give them jobs, whatever their age appropriate job is, have them help you because they just want to do something with you. They missed you. You were at work all day. They didn't see you. Even if it's making dinner, they want to help you. So let them help. And I think we're also worried about the cost. Well, if, you know, all this produce costs more, but there's a couple of slides. Um, oh, I had pictures with them. Did they not fit, Danny? I had pictures that I had pasted in, but... Um, so for $20, you could buy, um, on the left, you can buy, um, like over a pound of turkey sausage, a pound of tilapia, some lean ground turkey, peanut butter, green tea, lentils, crackers, or one large pizza with breadsticks from Domino's. So really when you think about it, it doesn't seem like it's that much money in the fast food, but it does add up versus what you could buy at the store. Or you can buy ground beef, cashews, strawberries, 10 pounds of potatoes, um, a pound of frozen mixed vegetables, a bunch of broccoli, dried beans, which is that's on my list of things to work on. I'm not good about beans and I haven't ever done the dried beans where you have to soak them, but I want to try that because they're so cheap. They're very cheap and very nutritious, lots of fiber 
and lots of protein. Or you could buy four Whopper combos. Um, so I think the tips are like, don't try to change everything at once. That won't work. You won't get there. You'll just get frustrated. You'll go back to your old habits. One thing when I see my kids who are, um, I'm worried about their body mass index and their weight, when I'm worried they've had a lot of weight gain, the first thing I tell them to do is try to get rid of those liquid calories. That's one of the easiest things to change. It doesn't take that much effort. Quit buying pop, quit buying lots of juice, um, make them drink water, skim milk, you know, figure out how many liquid calories they're getting and try to really decrease that. It's easy to do. It's not that big of a deal. Anybody can do that. Um, try to decrease your fast food or out to eat. Like I showed you with the McDonald's, I mean, probably the little cheeseburger happy meal is what like an adult should eat. So um, try to decrease how much you go out to dinner. When you go out to dinner, try to share. We're trying to do that a lot more. So we'll get like two entrees and split them between the five of us or get um, a couple salads and split that up in a couple entrees and try to, that makes our meal cheaper and we still have plenty to go around. We're never hungry. Um, so my husband and I sometimes will share a dinner and the kids will maybe share one or two kids meals, depending on how big they are. Some of the kids meals at some of those restaurants really are the size that an adult could eat. Um, so if you're going to go out, try to maybe share some, some meals. Um, I think sit, we all know, and this has been studied that people who sit down and eat meals as a family, um, eat healthier and the kids do better and there's less obesity. So the one other thing I want you to take away from this lecture is that I think all of us are forgetting sometimes that our kids just need to be kids and that family time is just as important as going to your fourth practice of the week for your select team because there's probably a one in a hundred thousand chance you're going to be a major leaguer when you grow up, but there's a one in however many, 50 or less chance that you're going to be overweight if you're running around and going through the drive through every night. So I mean, I've had to, we have to rein that in sometimes. We don't need to be going 100 miles an hour six days a week and going to every single practice and every single possible event. Kids need time to be kids. They need time to play. They need time to be home with their parents. This is, these are good life skills you're teaching them. And this is good family time that you're having. And so try to have dinner a couple times a week as a family, sit down and you know, we've had to make that choice. Um, my son's karate teacher kind of scolded me and said, well, you know, if you were here more at karate, he would be higher up on his belts. And I said, I don't really care. <laughs> He'll get there eventually. This is what's important for my family. This is too crazy. Both parents work. I cannot get him to karate three times a week. It's just not going to happen. So you'll just have to be happy with when he's here. And the rest of the time, we're going to do our stuff at home. Um, try to shop the perimeter of the grocery store. I'm sure you've heard that one before. Um, the good stuff, the healthy stuff is in the perimeter. The processed food is more in the middle. So try to stick to your veggies and your fruits and your meats and your dairy and try to stay away from the middle. Um, think about a garden. I'm going to try to do a little bit of a garden this year. I haven't been good about that. But that's great for kids. Gets you all outside. Gets you fresh air. Gets you a little exercise. Gets their hands in the dirt. They're excited about helping. They get to plant something and watch it grow. Then you know where this came from and it always tastes better if it's from the garden. So then they're going to have this fresh produce that's going to taste good and they're going to want to eat it. Um, and if you can't plant a garden, then go to the farmer's market on the weekends or go to the roadside stand and let them pick out some veggies that you haven't tried. Just let them be involved with that. And, you know, go outside and play. I hope the weather's going to turn at the end of the week and we're all going to be able to go outside and get fresh air and we're going to get, um, some vitamin D from the sunshine and we're going to exercise and run around. And again, that's part of letting our kids be kids and just play and they want to be with you and they want to play with you. And so do that. It's good for, good for everyone. Good for your family. Um, so I try to eat every year. I try to think about, okay, what am I doing better and what am I not doing better? So I don't buy fruit snacks anymore. We just don't buy them. Um, the only time we ever get them is if we're going on a long car trip, I'll give in and get them for that because they're easy to throw back at them, but I don't ever have that at home. Um, we eat a lot more fruits and vegetables that we used to, but we could still work on it. We could eat out less, definitely. We could plan meals ahead a little better. Um, my goal for this year is to have a garden and I want to try to make more food myself, like homemade granola bars and homemade salad dressing and um, like soups that I can make ahead and freeze and heat those up instead of getting it out of a can. If you go on Pinterest, which is I think most mom's favorite new <laughs> thing on the internet, there's about 
a million recipes for stuff like this on the internet. So I go on Pinterest now, but I think we should all have a goal like that. What can I do different? Um, I'm probably always going to have some junk food in my house and I'm working on it, but I'm still better than I was. So I think there's always room for improvement. And what else? Oh, my last um, couple slides here. These are some good websites. So that choosemyplate.gov is from the USDA. The American Academy of Pediatrics has healthychildren.org, and that actually has a different section for like each age, like the infants, the toddlers, the elementary, the teenagers. Um, sparkpeople.com is a free website. It's also a free app on your phone. You can track your calories. It has a ton of recipes. It has lots of good articles about diet and exercise. Hy-V has great recipes online. They have dietitians. Some of the dietitian services are free. Some are for a charge, but um, Hy-V has a lot of stuff. There's another mobile app called My Fitness Pal, which is just really a calorie tracker. And I don't really advocate um, kids, you know, tracking calories that closely day to day, especially teenage girls. We don't want them to get um, into an obsessive pattern of tracking calories. But I think it helps parents sometimes if the parent is kind of tracking their calories. I think that helps the whole family eat better. Weight Watchers has one as well if parents are doing that. So final thoughts. I think small little changes that you make over time, one at a time, can add up to healthy things for the future. And I think kids who can be very picky um, at times, if you just involve them in the process and explain to them why and as they get older give them more responsibility to kind of help you with that they're more adaptable than you might think and they're more willing to do new try new things and do new things and you have to remember that you're the parent so if you don't buy the food then it's not at your house to eat so sometimes you just have to put your foot down and say i don't really care if you want fruit loops we're not buying them and you just move on and so sometimes i think you have to remember that we're the ones who bring some of the junk in the home so we have to take responsibility and not buy it um, and so kids want our attention and to be involved in the family. And that's a great way to combine giving them some attention, involving them in a family project, and also eating healthy. Um, and that's, whoops, those are my three kids. So, And I was laughing because <laughs> this was the only picture I had um, handy with the three of them, but it was right by the funnel cake stand at the Creighton game. So isn't that sort of funny that that's the picture that ended up there? I have time for questions now if anybody has any. Back there, sir. If I microwave my food, does that take a lot of the nutritional value out of it? No, that's a good question. Um, not not necessarily. I think, um, oh, sorry. The question was if you microwave your food, does that take the nutritional value out of it? Um, a lot of the stuff I was talking about is like the steaming. And um, so a lot of those vegetables are steaming in the microwave, and that's fine. Um, I think if that's the way that is easiest for you to get your fruits and veggies and your healthy food, then I'm fine with that. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. So I have an eight-year-old boy, and he doesn't ever, he's always hungry 24-7. Right. So how do I know when enough is enough? Because I'm telling you, sometimes I really think he should not be hungry an hour later, and he ate everything on his plate. Right. right? Or if, you know, we run through Subway, he can eat a 12-foot uh, uh, foot long now, yeah. and he's still hungry. But he, I just don't feel that he should be. Should so be how do right. I... When do I say, no, you don't get any more food? Because I don't want to, if he's truly hungry, I want to give it to him, but I don't want him to just eat all day long. Like he's right. like a grazer. Right. So you don't want to, so the question is, how do you know she has an eight-year-old who seems hungry all the time and how do you know when enough is enough? Um, so I think, you know, if you really want to get scientific about it, you can try to keep track of his calories. But another thing that um, is a good rule of thumb is, and for us too, is are you hungry because you're really hungry or are you hungry because you're just bored or tired or stressed? And so they say if you're hungry enough to eat an apple, then you're really hungry. And if an apple isn't what you want and you know we just had supper an hour before, then you're probably not really hungry. So I think that's a good rule of thumb with kids. You know they eat a good amount, um, a good meal. And having some protein and some fat with each meal is a good way to try to keep them fuller and some fiber. Um, so if you have just a really sort of high carb, low fiber meal, you probably are gonna feel hungry again sooner because you're gonna have that really quick rise in blood sugar and then you're gonna crash a little and then that's gonna make you feel hungrier. So the best meals are ones that have some protein and some fat and some fiber and kind of like that my plate picture. You know, if you eat a couple 
a, ser a big serving of veggies and a big serving of fruits, you're going to get a fair amount of fiber and that should help fill you up until the next time it's time to eat again. And if you put a little, a little healthy fat and a little protein in there, that's really going to help you fill up. So I think some of it is like, what are we giving them at meals? Is it a good combo for our body? So, you know, I find that myself if I have a morning where I'm in a hurry and I just eat a bowl of oatmeal and nothing else with it. it. It does have some fiber. It keeps me full for a little while, but I'm usually hungry before lunch. But if I eat oatmeal and then I have an egg or something with it that has some protein and a little bit of fat, I usually feel better longer. And then also hunger can also be um, mistaken or thirst can be mistaken for hunger. So make sure that you're offering lots of water. And so sometimes if you say, well, you might just be thirsty. Why don't you have a glass of ice water and come back to me in a little bit if you still feel hungry? And then you can have some fruits or veggies or something like that. And if he's really hungry, you know, give him an apple with peanut butter or give him some celery with peanut butter or vegetables with hummus or something that has some fiber and some protein so he feels full longer. Yeah. Sorry. We were talking about the canned fruit. Mm -hmm. So um, there's the 100% juice or there's the no sugar added, which is like used with Splenda. Yeah. Which one is better? Because I, I think... I, <laughs> I'll buy whichever one is there, but which one's better? Well, I think that's a that's a tough question. It's one that I struggle with because um, I think we should all be a little bit wary of a lot of artificial sweeteners. And so the Splenda and things like that is, yes, no sugar, but an artificial sweetener. And some of our literature about that is that it's really um, not helping our body's uh, metabolism either. That's making us feel hungry sooner. Our body's treating that like a sort of sugar spike and crash, even though it's not true sugar and maybe we're not absorbing the calories, it's still kind of messing with our insulin level and our hunger cycle. So um, I've purchased either kind of those and I always kind of feel guilty when I buy the one with Splenda, but then I sort of feel guilty when I buy the one that has some sugar. So um, I think, you know, do what you can. I mean, if you're not eating 20 servings of Splenda a day, probably a little bit isn't going to hurt you, but um, you want to just moderate that. I think moderation is a big part of it. Um, and I know because I was just at the store today and um, late this afternoon, and I bought some, um, you know, the pineapples in its own juice in the little cups. So I think that's pretty good. But then the oranges I noticed had the Splenda that, that I was looking at. So um, so I don't know. I don't like to buy that, but sometimes you don't really have a choice. <laughs> but then, you know, they have the little ready to peel fresh oranges, the little clementines. So those are probably the best thing. Do you have questions from online or anything? So okay. A lot of nut related questions. Okay. Um, if a mom is expecting mm -hmm. and has a severe tree nut allergy, okay. should the dad avoid eating nuts too in case the infant will develop it? And that allergy when mom's like when they're trying to conceive or when mom's pregnant or after the fact. trimester so should dad avoid eating nuts now oh yeah and other people in the family um i don't think so no and then another mom had said that child was recently diagnosed with a bunch of allergies okay. including milk and nut allergies mm -hmm. but up until that point had consumed um, wasn't a big milk drinker, but had done other dairy products and nuts mm -hmm. without any reactions. Should they stop that? Well, the allergy stuff is um, not always very black and white. So that's something that you probably have to talk to that child's doctor about. But we'll have kids who will test positive um, for a specific food allergy as we're evaluating them for allergies. And sometimes the parents will say, well, they eat that all the time and it's fine. So what a test shows and what happens in real life is not always 100% equal. Um, I've had kids who have tested, po I had a child who tested positive for peanut allergy after he had this horrible allergic reaction to a bunch of other nuts. And we did this whole panel and his peanut came up positive, pretty highly positive. And mom said, well, he eats peanut butter like every single day of his life. So we had him go to the allergist and they ended up doing what they call um, a, a food challenge and they make you sit in the allergist office and bring in your own same peanut butter that you always eat and eat your same sandwich that you always eat in front of the allergist and then they make you sit there for like three hours and they see if you have any reaction and if you don't then you passed your food challenge and you can keep eating it which is sort of funny because the child had already eaten peanut butter all the time but now that we had this test and we'd had this other horrible life-threatening allergic reaction to nuts we were all understandably a little bit leery of giving him peanut again until we knew for sure so that was what we did. 
Um, so sometimes kids will test positive for egg allergy or nut allergy or dairy, and that does not always correlate to having trouble in real life. And sometimes allergy symptoms are more subtle and they're not always life-threatening trouble breathing. Sometimes it's a skin, bad skin eczema or a lot of tummy upset or trouble gaining weight. So, you know, you have to kind of temper that with what else is going on with your child. Do they have horrible eczema and now they're testing positive for a milk allergy? Well, maybe if you take milk and dairy out of their diet, their eczema will get better. Um, so sometimes that's where that child's doctor or allergist can help you sort that out. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I don't have this problem quite yet, but with children who are taking lunches to school mm -hmm. or even like taking sack lunches like to the zoo or something mm -hmm. like that, and with foods that are kind of temperature sensitive mm -hmm. as far as like leftovers and stuff like that, even though they have like those ice packs that you can put in right. the bags or whatever, um, what can you do to like kind of ease ease the stress of making sure that they have a nutritious meal for lunch, but yet it's still temperature safe, safe to where Correct. it's not going to harm them. Um, well, I think you have to, again, look at what your situation is. So if you know they're going to go on a field trip to the zoo and it's going to be 95 degrees and you have an ice pack in there, you know, that probably wouldn't be the best day to give them a sandwich with a bunch of mayo and stuff on it because that's maybe not going to stay as cold as you would like it to, even though you have it in the lunch bag with the ice. Um, that might be a day to do peanut butter and jelly that's not as temperature sensitive. So um, I think, you know, it's really hard with school lunches. I run into this too. Um, my kids get tired of eating the same sandwich every day. They want something different. And then you're saying, well, if you want a thermos of soup, is it going to stay hot enough? Are you even going to want it by lunchtime? Or is it going to be all cooled down and not taste good? Um, so I think you have to you know, some people, I've looked at this stuff online, once food's out more than about two hours at room temperature, it's really not safe. So they've looked at um, how long does an ice pack really keep food cold, and you really have to invest in a good insulated lunch bag, and maybe you have to put a couple ice packs in there, or maybe you have to put the drink that you're sending in the freezer so that the drink can be another kind of ice pack and keep it colder, and the drink will thaw throughout the morning and then hopefully be um, you know, defrosted in, um, in liquid form when it's time for lunch. So some people do that. They'll put an ice pack and a frozen drink in there. Like a, um, if you do bottled water, you just have to pour off a little of the water before you freeze it so it doesn't, the bottle doesn't explode in your freezer. Um, so that's, I mean, it is difficult. I think it's a challenge for all of us. And sometimes when you have a situation where you just don't think you're going to have a good temperature control, then try to send something that isn't as temperature sensitive. So, yeah, that's tough. I have another one. Yeah. Um, now with like infants, mm -hmm. um, infants slash toddlers, what are your thoughts on like pacifiers? Because I know like a lot of hospitals will automatically give infants the pacifiers like right away, mm -hmm. even in the nursery and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Well, what I usually tell moms is if they're trying to breastfeed, then I don't really want you to do much pacifier use in that first week or so because I every time that baby's acting like they want to suck on something, they should be trying to breastfeed because that's going to help the milk come in. Um, if you're sticking a pacifier in that baby's mouth because you're tired and you want to sleep and you're not nursing them and you're only nursing every four or five hours, you're probably not going to get a good milk supply because you haven't had that baby to your breast often enough. Once the baby has had good breastfeeding established and good weight gain, then I'm okay with using a pacifier for comfort. Sometimes babies need um, to suck more for comfort than nutrition. So as they get a little bit older and you know, okay, they just fed well, they're not hungry, and they just act like they want to suck on something, it's fine. Um, my cutoff to get rid of a pacifier is age two. It's great if you do it earlier, but two is kind of my upper limit. I would like it to be gone by then. If you use it longer than that, you can get a lot of... Um, problems with the positioning of your teeth and things like that. And it's, I think that again, the older you wait, the longer you wait to get rid of it, the harder it will be. So if you can get it away from them by the time they're two, then you hopefully won't have as many meltdowns about it. <laughs> All right. Lab questions. Another question. What do you do about the kids who refuse to eat anything? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I have a niece who, um, she's a little bit naughty and she has about five things she'll eat and that's it. Chicken nuggets, pizza, uh, crackers, um, applesauce, and waffles. And so she lives out of state, and when she comes to visit, she has nuclear meltdowns, we call them, about food. And it's really hard. It's hard for everybody. It's hard for everyone in the family because um, they end up buying her separate food, or my mom, when they're coming to visit, will go 
the store and buy chicken nuggets and little pizzas for her, which isn't really helping the problem. It's just enabling her, right? So we're just enabling her to continue to be a picky eater. And so one night they were here to visit and we made spaghetti, which all the other kids in the family, it's great. We made a nice healthy dinner with um, some, you know, whole grain pasta and good marinara sauce and lean ground beef. And we had salad and it was a great dinner. My kids dug in, my nephews dug in. And she just absolutely turned up her nose, wouldn't even come sit at the table, would not sit, would not do it. And the problem is then is she'll just say, I'm not hungry when she really is. And then two hours later, she's absolutely starving because she didn't eat. And then she has a meltdown about it. And so it's very frustrating because I feel like if my brother would just let me have her for about a month, I could maybe get her through some of that. But I think now it's a path of least resistance thing. She's five it's her meltdowns are harder. She's older. They just don't want to deal with it. So they just give in and give it to her. And she ends up eating food that isn't healthy. She ends up getting constipated. It's a bad cycle. So I think what you have to do is, again, this is where you're the parent and you can't be their friend. You have to be their parent and you have to sit them down. You're not a short order cook. That is not your job. So if you're making a meal for the family, that has to be the meal for the family. Um, if they don't want to eat it, you can offer them some, you know, easy fruits and veggies or something on the side. Um, and if they don't like it, then they'll have to be hungry. And what you realize is that if you let them do that for a couple days, their hunger is going to win out over their pickiness and they will start to eat these other foods. Because um, I'm sure you've had an experience where maybe you were out doing something um, and running around or outside um, on a camping trip or something, and maybe the dinner wasn't your favorite, but you were famished and it was like the best, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich or the best tuna sandwich you've ever had tasted so good because you were so hungry. So I think sometimes we have to let them get a little bit hungry and not give in and throw some snacks at them later when they're complaining um, just to get them to be quiet. Make them stick to the diet the rest of you are eating, and it's going to be hard, and they're going to melt down, and you're going to have a few days that are tough. But it's better than having five years that are tough, right? So I think that's what you have to do. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Sorry I went over. That was a little bit longer, but thanks for staying.